Okay, so good evening, uh, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, postgraduate lecture series. And today we're going to talk about a very interesting issue of hypernatremia. As you are aware, the postgraduate lecture series is focusing about different aspects of pediatric endocrinology, and we are planning over the next three years to complete about the entire aspect on that regard. So we had this 14-year-old girl who presented with failure to thrive. And actually at 14 days, she was lower as compared to the birth weight. And that's a very significant finding in that perspective. She was entirely <clears throat> breastfed and was found to have a sodium of 182. So this was a very devastating scenario, very difficult to manage. And what it was found out was that this was actually what is known as breast milk related hypernatremia in that there was concentrated blood of a sodium very high and concentrated urine, meaning that body is trying to eliminate sodium, but it is unable to. So this was a breast milk related hypernatremia, which is a lethal condition, a avoidable condition, which we should try to avoid if there is enough feeding evaluation in that setting. A second situation was more of a iatrogenic problem. A three month old girl with altered sensorium was found to have hypernatremia, sodium of 170, and a urinary osmolality was low. Now, as I discussed in the first case, the main thing to look at hypernatremia is what is the urine? If you have a concentrated blood and a dilute urine, like in this case, your diagnosis of diabetes insipidus is already made and you do not need to worry to do anything else. You have to go for an AVP response. Now, what unfortunately was done in this case was that they would advise a water deprivation test. Somebody who's already water deprived, who has a severe dehydration, if you do that, will develop seizures. So while we need to be careful in terms of assessment, we need to know what will be the right strategy. And this is what we'll discuss subsequently from that perspective. So hypernatremia is a relatively rarer condition as compared to hyponatremia, which we discussed last time. But this is one which is associated with significant complications in both in terms of assessment, in terms of management as well. And this was a classical case of DI in which we didn't need to do any water deprivation and easily we could have made the diagnosis in that perspective. So today we are going to talk about a bit about pathophysiology. Then we'll talk about criteria and etiology by Dr. Sain. I'll touch base about evaluation and management. And finally, we have the Q&A session in which we'll keep it interactive. So all of you can put your answers and we'll see how well our class has gone in terms of that in that scenario. All of you can go and have a look at our website, learning.growsociety.in, which has got uh, multiple information pathways, courses with regards to pediatric endocrinology, our YouTube site, which has got multiple videos, and a learning platform which provides evidence-based validated learning in pediatric endocrinology using practical tools for diagnosis and assessment in that regard. We specifically have a three-year uh, online and a two-year offline fellowship program in pediatric endocrinology, along with pediatric endocrinology for postgraduates, specifically targeting the topics which are very, very relevant for pediatricians and pediatric endocrinologists in the form of growth, puberty, thyroid, calcium, electrolyte. And it has got a lot of interactive videos, texts, which are available from that perspective. We cover three specific uh, free webinars every month in the form of specific to a particular topic, which is relevant for a pediatric endocrinology perspective, from a pediatric uh, perspective. And finally, the postgraduate lecture series, uh, which we try to cover specific topics. And we have a schedule which is there for the next three years, which will basically cover the entirety in that scenario. We've got publications, both basic and advanced pediatric endocrinology to cover the entirety. And uh, you can access our mobile application, which provides validated tools to evaluate, assess, and manage complicated endocrine conditions like hypernatremia. So the management of hypernatremia will depend upon the severity and the symptom. The acute management, you can compare this to the management of diabetic ketoacidosis. We want to cover it over 48 hours with a maintenance fluid, which is 4 to 1 formula, the holiday cigar equation followed by free water deficit. And how do you calculate free water deficit? For every rise in serum sodium above one millimole per liter, you will have a four ml per kg of free water deficit. So you look at maintenance, free water deficit, and ongoing loss of urine, and then you replace it over 48 hours. This is how you do that. Now, very importantly, as I said, if it's a acute hypernatremia, you can give a rapid correction initially, but if it's a chronic, you have to be slow. 
So you do not want a, a fall even in acute of more than 12 millimoles per liter per day. In chronic, it will be like six to nine. So similar to hyponatremia, because osmoles can create a problem, you may go into cerebral edema, be a bit cautious in that scenario. Protocol usually, we'll talk a bit about hyponatremic dehydration, but the usual protocol is to give around half normal saline, 70 to 100 millimoles per liter, 120% maintenance, and usually you're talking about the right fluid that's there. Very importantly, you have to monitor sodium very closely because whatever fluid protocols you use, you are expect that there will be a fall in sodium in that regards. Look at the Glasgow coma scale. And if there is a rapid fall, give 3% saline to push it up to allow a good response because that can be a problem in that regards. We have developed a hypernatremia fluid calculator as part of our many classes equation, which gives you the exact amount of fluid rate the type of fluid based upon the serum sodium and the dehydration level in that regards. So how do we really calculate fluid for somebody who has hypernatremic dehydration? The key parameters to look at is how much is the fluid deficit based upon the dehydration level? How much is the free water deficit? And as I said, for every millimole per kg, so if your sodium is above 140, it's four ml per kg. So that's the easiest way to calculate. There's another way, but I'll say four ml per kg Free water deficit is the best one in that regards. You calculate the isotonic deficit, which is the fluid deficit minus the free water deficit. You get the isotonic deficit. You calculate the maintenance as far as fluid, sodium, and potassium. You correct based upon the bolus volume, which was given. So if somebody is dehydrated, the first will be a normal sign bolus. And then you will subtract that sodium and fluid from that. And bolus sodium is subtracted. And then you'll get the food formula you look at volume, tonicity in that regards. Very importantly, monitor closely for the hemodynamic status. If there is a rapid fall of sodium more than 12 millimoles per liter per day in acute and nine in chronic, you reduce the rate. And if you have seizures or the feature developing, you may re-raise it using 3% saline in that regard. So just to give an example, you have a two-year-old girl, 12 kilograms, 10% dehydration and sodium is 160. So what's the dehydration level? So it's 10%, so it's 1200 ml. So 1200 ml is the dehydration. What's the free water deficit? So four into weight into 140, which is 160 minus 140 becomes 20. So it's 960 ml. So out of 1200 ml, 960 ml is actually the free water deficit. The isotonic deficit therefore is 240 ml. The maintenance requirement for two days, we have calculated as 2200 ml and 96 millimoles of sodium. The child has already received a 10 ml per kg of normal cell line, so 120 ml of uh, fluid, and uh, you will subtract that from the isotonic and you will get the equation. So essentially, you have to give around, uh, around 40 millimoles per liter, depending upon the severity, you will get different formulas. So roughly, 70-35 is the best half normal saline, but sometimes you may need to give a lower one. If your sodium levels are higher, you will get the calculation. And as I said, we've got a tool in our analytics section which will help you guide from that perspective. Just a word about neurosurgical diabetes insipidus, which is post-operative. It has got three phases. The first phase is the cell swelling. And because of the cell swelling, you have diabetes insipidus, which is transient DI, followed by release of AVP, which is SIADH. And finally, you have necrosis, which causes permanent DI. So this is an evolving scenario. And if you give them vasopressin, there would be confusion in that regards. You have to differentiate it from salt wasting and fluid excess. Diagnosis is based upon hypernatremia. Again, concentrated blood and dilute urine, which will give you a diagnosis. Just to summarize, if you have to attend a patient who is in the neurosurgical ward post-surgery, you start half normal saline at a 300 ml per meter square per day plus urine output and monitor sodium output, hydration, and electrolytes. Look at sodium and osmolality. If your sodium is less than 135, you are having a salt wasting. Give sodium chloride and fludrocot. If your sodium is 135 to 150, that's your target. No problem. Continue. If it's above 150 and your urinary osmolality is high, you are hypovolemic. Give more fluids. If you have an osmolarity which is less, a dilute urine with a concentrated blood, this is DI, and then you can think of fluid 
versus AVP in that regard. So neurosurgical fluid management basically is start with half normal saline, replace urine output. If your sodium becomes low, give sodium chloride and, and fluidocord if required. The sodium becomes about 150. Exclude dehydration, increase the fluid rate. And if you do not exclude dehydration, there's no dehydration, you start thinking of giving fluid or ABP. This could be diabetes insipidus in that regard. How about severe hyponatremia, like 190 over three days correction? Generally speaking, if we have a very, very high level of sodium around 190, that's a very dangerous scenario. There's a very high risk of metabolic acidosis, which will happen. There's very high risk of renal failure. So while we have to correct it slowly over a 72 hour period, I will be very cautious and start considering dialysis as a scenario in that regard. So that's something. Otherwise, if you waste time, that will be a very, very severe situation in that regard. Come up. You can all go and have a look at our website, applications, and books. I will really thank uh, Dr. Naveen and Dr. Sayan for being part of this program. And they've really made it very, very interesting.